Kyler Eust believed that he was not good enough for the girls he dated. He was under the impression that if he couldn't have them, then nobody should. This is Monsters. Kyler Eust was born on September 14, 1988, and had an all-too-common childhood for people who kill, a strained relationship with his parents and a childhood where he was raised by his grandparents. Kara Kopetsky was born in Frankfurt, Germany, but her family eventually moved to Belton, Missouri, just outside of Kansas City. Her parents divorced and her mother, Rhonda, met Jim Beckford while working at UPS. They got married when Kara was nine years old and went on to have a son together, Thomas. By the age of 17, Kara was attending Belton High School and living the life of your average teenage girl, hanging out with friends, listening to music, and talking on the phone. One month, she had spent so much time talking and texting on her cell phone that her bill was 40 pages long. She also was a bit of a rebel who had begun cutting classes and smoking cigarettes. Kara met Kyler around the middle of 2006, and friends said that there were many instances of tension, jealousy, and abuse between the couple. Some reported seeing bruises on Kara's arms and encouraging her to break it off with Kyler. The relationship only lasted about nine months, and the two broke up in April of 2007. On April 28th, Kyler showed up outside of the Popeye's restaurant where Kara worked and forced her into his vehicle. He drove her around, angry that she wouldn't hang out with him, but eventually let her out of the car in Grandview, the next town over from Belton. On April 30th, Kara and her mother, Rhonda, went to the Cass County Court and filed an order of child protection against Kyler Eust. In the application, she wrote, quote, Saturday, 428, kidnapped, restrained, one month ago choked me, December 6th, had knife in hand and said, I'm gonna slit your motherfucking throat, March 7th, wouldn't let me out of my home, end quote. When the application asked, immediate and present danger of abuse to the child exists because, she wrote, quote, I'm unsure of what he will do next, the abuse has gotten worse over time, end quote. Kyler was served the order of protection and told he was not to have any contact with Kara on May 1st, 2007. On May 4th, Kara is seen on surveillance leaving her school at 9.19 a.m., and she disappears. Kara was supposed to work a shift at Popeye's that evening, but never showed up. After she failed to return home that night, Rhonda reported her missing. The report was taken, but since the legal age in Missouri was 17, they didn't respond to the report with urgency. Unfortunately, when an adult goes missing, authorities don't always take the report seriously. They say something like, well, they're an adult, they probably just took off. When Kara's family hadn't heard from her the following day, police started looking into her disappearance. When authorities searched her room, they became more concerned. In her room, they found her clothes, makeup, a carton of cigarettes with only one pack missing, and the iPod she had recently gotten as a Christmas gift. A search of her school locker turned up her debit card and there had been no activity on her bank account. Her family revealed that she had a job interview at a local convenience store on the 5th and had made plans with friends for the next two weekends. Activity on her cell phone stopped on the 4th as well. It was unlikely that she had left on her own without taking her belongings, her cigarettes, and her debit card. Police questioned Kyler on March 6th, and though he admitted to kidnapping Kara a week prior, he claimed to have no idea what happened to her now. Even though he is clearly the obvious suspect in the case, authorities can't find any evidence connecting him to Kara's disappearance, and they move on. On June 2, 2007, an 18-year-old girl named Kelsey Smith disappeared from Overland Park, just over the border in Kansas. The media realized the similarities between Kara and Kelsey, and they swarmed in to report on a possible serial crime. Jim and Rhonda did interviews with Geraldo Rivera and Nancy Grace before police determined that the cases were not related. Kelsey Smith was raped and killed by Edwin Hall, who was arrested on June 6, 2007. He pleaded guilty to all counts and was sentenced to life in prison without parole. The television show See No Evil, 
called Murder on CCTV in some places, had their debut episode about Kelsey. The episode was titled, We See You, Kelsey. The case goes cold, and over the next decade, reports continually come in that Kyler had confessed to killing Kara. On April 26, 2010, one of Kyler's friends reported that he had gotten drunk and confessed to killing Kara the previous year. Kyler had also confessed to the murder to Caitlin Ferris, a girl he had dated in high school. In 2010, the FBI approached Caitlin and asked her to wear a wire while meeting with the suspect. She agreed, and since she had moved out of state, she made up a reason to come back and visit and set up a date to hang out with Kyler. After she picked him up, she can be heard on the recording asking him why he's in a bad mood. He told her that he was upset that she moved away and that she was dating someone else. Then he goes on a self-loathing rant saying, quote, I'm nothing to you. I'm going to be alone for the rest of my life. You're never going to hold me. You're never going to hold my hand. You're never going to brush my hair behind my ears. I will never be loved. Every time I meet someone, I'm not good enough for them. End quote. Ugh, give me a break. There's a reason women don't want to be with him. It could have something to do with the fact that he's abusive and possessive. Eventually, the pair arrive at a restaurant, and it's there that Kyler could be heard saying, quote, I strangled the fuck out of her. End quote. Why Kyler was not arrested at that point is anybody's guess. Prosecutors can be a little gun-shy bringing charges against someone with only one small piece of evidence. In 2011, more reports of people saying Kyler confessed to them came in, and on August 17th, Kansas City Police received a report that Kyler had tried to kill his pregnant girlfriend. When Officer Joshua Meyer investigated, Candace St. Clair told him that in the early morning hours of July 23rd, Kyler came home drunk and the couple started arguing. When Candace told him that she was going to leave him, Kyler grabbed her and dragged her into the bedroom, where he pinned her down on the bed. He then began strangling her until she almost lost consciousness, but then he would punch her in the legs to wake her up. When she started to scream, he said, quote, If you scream again, I will kill you, faster than you could let out another scream out of your throat, end quote. She eventually lost consciousness, and when she awoke, Kyler was laying behind her, spooning her and whispering in her ear, quote, I love you, end quote. Candace said that Kyler told her he would kill her, her family, and specifically her little sister if she went to the police. He then said, quote, I've killed people before, even ex-girlfriends out of sheer jealousy. I will kill you, end quote. Police also found text messages to Candace from Kyler threatening to commit suicide if she didn't get back together with him. Along with this report, Candace also told police that about a month and a half earlier, she came home from work and observed Kyler beat one of their kittens on the bathroom floor, killing it. Prior to that, she claimed that he had taken two of the kittens, tied them up in a sack, and threw them into the creek behind their apartment complex. Kyler was released on assault charges, but was released with supervised probation. A restraining order was placed against him, and the judge told him to have no contact with Candace. He was in court a few days later on charges of animal cruelty, for which he was released on a $1,000 bond. There's no information about the punishment for the animal abuse, but it wasn't likely much. Of course, a few months later, Kyler was pulled over for speeding, and guess who was in the passenger seat? Candace. Kyler wasn't charged with violating the restraining order because authorities couldn't find documentation that Kyler had been properly served the order papers. Quality job, cops. Really nice. In 2012, Kyler Eust was arrested after he received drugs in the mail. They were a synthetic drug that was supposed to be similar to ecstasy. He pleaded guilty to felony drug trafficking and received a sentence of three years and nine months in federal prison, followed by three years of probation. In September of 2015, a Belton detective traveled to the federal prison in Oklahoma and tried to get information about the disappearance of Kara, but he refused to talk about the subject. In March of 2016, Kyler's former cellmate told police that Kyler was worried after the visit from the detective. He had asked him to help him establish an alibi and eventually broke down and confessed to killing Kara. The cellmate said he had strangled Kara and disposed of her body in the woods. 
That account was the seventh time that someone had told authorities that Kyler had confessed to them and they all had matching stories. Jessica Runyons was 21 years old and lived in the Kansas City area. She was the daughter of John and Jamie Runyons, and she had two younger sisters. She worked as a pastry chef and had recently been promoted to manager. Her father, John, said that she was skilled at making and decorating cakes. Cooking together was one of their favorite father-daughter activities. Jessica had a boyfriend, and he happened to be childhood friends with Kyler Eust. Some report Jessica as Kyler's girlfriend, but that doesn't seem to be the case. It's been suggested that the couple may have been having an affair, but their true relationship isn't entirely clear. On September 2, 2016, Kyler was released from prison, and only four days later, he attended a party in Grandview, Missouri, where he was seen leaving with Jessica at about 11 o'clock that night. Jessica is never seen alive again. When Jessica failed to meet her mother at a doctor's appointment on the 9th, the police were notified that she was missing. Witnesses at the party told police that Kyler was drinking heavily and acted possessive toward Jessica. Some said they saw the two arguing. This may have been Jessica putting an end to their affair if they were having one, or turning down his advances if they weren't. At 1.41 on the morning of September 10th, the Kansas City Fire Department responded to a car fire on Blue River Road near East 95th Street. It was the black 2012 Chevrolet Equinox that belonged to Jessica. That same day, Kyler's half-brother, Jessup Carter, called the Belton police and told them that his brother had confessed to him that he had strangled Jessica and dragged her body into a wooden area. Kyler then asked him to help torch the car. Jessup told authorities that when Kyler lit the car on fire, he sustained burns to his hands and face. Then Jessup gave Kyler a ride to his house, where police arrested him on September 11, 2016. Police noted that Kyler had burns on his hands and face, as well as scratches on his face. Kyler, where's Jessica? I have no idea, sir. What happened to your face? Did you get burned? What happened to your face? Did you kill Jessica? Did you? No answer? He was charged with burning Jessica's car, but not for the murder since authorities didn't have enough evidence to prove she was deceased. When Kyler was arrested, he made a phone call to his mother from the jail where the two began arguing. Why don't you tell me where Jessica's at so that her family can have her? So all the yes. time, I sat in the front window of my house waiting for you to come pick me up with a backpack full of clothes for the weekend. And those all the time she didn't show up. So that was my grandpa's fault. So that's why you go and kill a girl? That's part Give of me it. a break. That's part of oh, it. Oh, that's part of it. That's why you did it. A big, huge part of it, too, Kenny, yeah. Wow, Kyler. It's my, I, I would say I would say it's probably about 50 50. So, did you kill Kyler, too? Yeah, you know, I'm going to talk to a lawyer today, Mom. In the call, Kyler says that his issues with her were part of the reason he killed a girl. His mother eventually hung up on him. Of course, realizing that the call was recorded, Kyler called his mother back and claimed he had just been lying to hurt her. For a person who didn't murder anybody, he sure does confess to murder a lot. I've never murdered anybody, and you know what else I've never done? Confess to murdering anybody. Weird. Both of the families of Kara and Jessica came together based on their common goal, to get justice for their daughters. They spent months searching wooded areas for their missing girls, and in the process, they stumbled onto yet more tragedy. On January 21, 2017, Jessica's father discovered human remains in a creek bed near a park in Kansas City. These remains weren't likely to be those of Jessica or Kara's, because they were of a larger man who ended up being identified as 21-year-old Brandon Herring. Brandon had gone missing November 22, 2016. His mother, Rhonda Herring, gave him a call to see how his day was and reported that nothing seemed out of the ordinary, but that was the last time she spoke to him. She said that she called him back about 15 minutes later because she had forgotten to ask him something, but his phone was off. It's believed that Brandon died due to a robbery. His mother said he had money on him to buy a truck and to put a deposit on an apartment for his upcoming family. He was shot outside of an apartment complex and his body was dumped in the creek. 
He left behind a fiancé who is pregnant and now has a son who will never meet his father. The murder is unsolved, so if you have any information about the death of Brandon Herring in the Kansas City area, you can call the Kansas City Crime Stoppers tips line at 816-474-8477. If that wasn't enough, a second man's body was discovered during the search, just a week later on January 29th. That body was identified as 19-year-old Dante Jamal Jefferson, who went missing on December 5th. Dante was last seen getting into a gray Chrysler in central Kansas City. He had been living with his mother at the time and was known to keep in regular contact with her. After not hearing from him through the holidays, she filed a missing persons report at the beginning of January. The cause of death wasn't published, but the police said they considered it a homicide. It has also not been solved, so if you have any information about the death of Dante Jamal Jefferson, you can call the same tips hotline at 816-474-8477. During an interview, Jamie Runyon said, quote, You don't realize how many homicides there are, how many missing people there are, until you become part of this group you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy. End quote. On April 3, 2017, a man was hunting for mushrooms when he stumbled onto human remains in a rural area not far from Peculiar, Missouri. I'm not making that up. When police arrived, they did a thorough search of the area and found a second set of remains. The second set was obviously much older than the first set. The Kansas City Medical Examiner identified the first set of remains as Jessica Runyon's on April 5th. The second set of remains had to be sent to the FBI Crime Laboratory in Quantico, Virginia, where they were identified as Kara Kopetsky on August 16th. Murder charges and the deaths of Kara and Jessica were filed against Kyler Eust on October 5, 2017. Four days later, Kyler pleaded not guilty to all charges. Of course, the defense tried to claim that Kyler was not competent to stay in trial, a move that almost every defense with no good case tries to make. After an evaluation, Kyler was deemed competent to stand trial. The defense continued to delay the trial. They requested additional DNA testing of both Kara and Jessica. They claimed that evidence was found of a recording of someone else confessing to the crime and they needed time to investigate. They said COVID was slowing them down. They accused one of the investigators of having a sexual relationship with one of the witnesses. They claimed that some of their phone calls with Kyler were accidentally recorded. Defense lawyers will purposefully delay trials to give themselves time to try to dig up something, anything, that proves their client is not guilty. Kyler's defense pushed the trial back to April of 2021, but the murderer eventually got his day in court. Shortly after turning his brother in, Jessup was arrested on an unrelated arson charge. He committed suicide while in jail in 2018. With Jessup unable to defend himself, Kyler's defense was that his brother was the actual murderer. Kyler claimed that Jessup was actually a serial killer. Unfortunately for him, with the overwhelming number of people who he had confessed to, plus the recorded confession from Caitlin Ferris, the jury wasn't fooled. Kyler Eust was found guilty of one count of second-degree murder and one count of voluntary manslaughter. The jury recommended the maximum sentence for both charges. Life in prison with the possibility of parole after 30 years for the second-degree murder charge and 15 years for the voluntary manslaughter charge. The judge has not handed down a sentence yet, but it's expected any day. Kyler committed murder just four days after being released from prison before, so let's hope the sentence this time is a long one. I just want to start by saying that it's been a very long 14 years, and we would not be here today if it wasn't for the amazing support of the community and you guys, the media, because you helped get our kids' stories out there, and you, if it wasn't for you, people wouldn't know as much about Cara and Jessica. I just want to thank the community also and you guys um, for allowing us to have the last four and a half year, four years of just not bugging us and just allowing us to concentrate on our girls. Um, we appreciate everybody's support and the community has been amazing. The love for the girls have just been 
it's it's overwhelming and we just thank you guys for all your prayers love and support and we're just thankful we're thankful to be where we are today because there were days where we didn't know if our girls would ever be found and we're just so thankful that they were found and, and we, we have them back now if you're the victim of domestic abuse please reach out to someone for help please call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. The great thing about this website is that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will instantly take your browser to a Google search page. In the event the abuser is nearby, you can assure that you don't get caught trying to get help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Be safe. Thanks so much for watching this video. You can help us out by hitting the like button or leaving us a comment. You can also subscribe to the show to ensure you don't miss an episode. Also, remember that if you'd like to support the show, the easiest way is to donate a few bucks at Buy Me A Coffee or check out some of our merchandise at Teespring. You can find information on how to do that along with links to our social media at thisismonsters.com. Thanks again.